Good afternoon and welcome to the Galliford Tri Holdings PLC investor presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company can review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Andrew Duxbury, CFO. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Many thanks, Lily, and welcome, everybody. It's really good to be with you again. So uh, what I plan to do is present for you know, 20 minutes or so, and then we'll go to, to questions and hopefully uh, address all the questions that you might have. So what I'll do is I'll cover a review of the financial year ended 30th of June 2023, and we'll then move on to focus a bit more on the strategy and the outlook for the business. So to start with some headlines before coming back to these in a little bit more detail, we are really pleased with our performance in the year to 30th of June. And of course that's been achieved thanks to the hard work and the contribution of everyone in the business and across our supply chain. So our thanks absolutely go to, go to all those people. And it's worth remembering this was delivered against a really challenging economic backdrop. And in that context, all of our businesses have performed well and we're pleased with the position of each of those businesses going forwards. In particular, the acquisitions that we've made, and we've made three acquisitions over the last 18 to 20 months, those acquisitions are really starting to settle in well and will start to really contribute to the growth of the business uh, as we go forwards. Our pre-exceptional profit before tax is up 23% in the year and our full year dividend is up 31% in the year. I'll come on to those numbers in a little bit more detail uh, in a moment. Looking forward, the order book is in really good shape, 3.7 billion pounds, that's our, our largest ever order book. And more importantly, the quality within that order book is, is really excellent. And beyond that order book, we also have a strong pipeline of further opportunities that we're currently looking at and assessing. It's worth remembering that we're a non-cyclical business and of course our forward visibility that order book takes us through beyond the next general election so that gives us some really good certainty going into fy24 and beyond looking at that we're increasingly confident of our performance in the new financial year to june 2024 and so last week we raised our guidance to say that we'd be at the upper end of the current range of analysts uh, expectations and that was 24 to 28 million pounds of profit before tax and we said we'll be at the upper end of that range we're also increasingly confident in meeting our fy26 strategic targets and partly due to that confidence we've increased our dividend further and improved our dividend cover policy again i'll come back to that a little bit later in the presentation So this is just a brief reminder of our investment proposition. So Galliford Tri is a high quality business. We operate with leading positions in market sectors that are non-cyclical and that are showing good growth potential. And we're generating as a result of that increasing returns for our shareholders. The growth opportunities in our sectors remains very strong and we've got seeing good levels of government investment in the sectors in which we operate. And increasingly we're seeing increasing barriers to entry based on quality. And that's really important to help us deliver profitable growth going forwards. The risk uh, profile of our portfolio of projects is very, very good. And we've got excellent forward visibility uh, of the order book, as I mentioned earlier. We've got the culture and the right culture embedded across our business to focus on discipline, focus on risk, and that will help the business to deliver our strategy of sustainable growth. And our financial position is very strong. And we're demonstrating a track record of delivering predictable financial results year on year. And you can see that here on this slide. It's three full financial years since we demerged from our house building business. And since then, we've been delivering consistent, profitable growth. And this slide is really important. This slide is the evidence of the strong foundations that we've built in the business. And this slide forms the basis of the confidence that we've got for our future growth. And it's worth just noting those numbers there. Revenue growth, pre-exceptional profit before tax has grown faster, pre-exceptional earnings per share has grown, and dividends per share has grown 123% over the last 
two years since FY21. So just coming back to the results for the last financial year, our performance is in line with the strategic targets we set ourselves. We set our targets in 2021 through to 2026. We're two of the five years through that period, and we're on track to meet those targets we set ourselves for FY26. Revenue in the last financial year was up 12.5%, and that was reflecting particularly strong growth in our environment or our water uh, business. Our divisional operating margin has remained stable, 2.4%, but that includes some one-off costs that I'll come back to in a moment, and so it gives us good confidence that we're on track for our 3% margin target. Pre-exceptional profit before tax is up 22.5%, and that excludes the effect of the one-off contract settlement that we announced in June this year. And just to remind everybody, that contract settlement brought to an end the last legacy contract. It was a long-running dispute, and it resulted in a cash receipt to Gallifer Troy of £26 million. The result to June does include a £3.6 million profit on the sale of a joint venture investment stake. That was a non-core uh, investment. And also we reported exceptional costs, 10.6 million pounds. That was related entirely to our investment in new cloud-based digital systems. I described that last time we met. And importantly, those systems are now live. So altogether, our pre-exceptional earnings per share has increased by 18% compared to the same period last year. The quality of our order book is really important in uh, delivering that strong contract portfolio, and that continues to be the key driver of our margin improvement target. And you can see in the year to June, our uh, operating profit before amortization increased by three and a half million pounds to 21.9 million pounds. And that was helped by our volume growth. But what I really want to draw out on this slide is that the margin includes that 3.4 million of cost of living and acquisition costs. So that was just over £2 million of net losses on two acquisitions that we made in the year, MCS and Ham Baker. And those losses were because of the state of those businesses when we acquired them. They were both in or close to administration. We also made a £1 million cost of living payment in October 2022 to, our, uh, to about half of our uh, employees. So without these two uh, expenditures, our 2.4% margin would have been 2.6% margin. And that's why it provides us real confidence in our growth trajectory going forwards. But one point I would just stress, both of those two things, the cost of living payment and the acquisitions were really good investments in the future, in our people and in our future capabilities in the water sector. We operate with a very strong balance sheet. And that balance sheet is really important. It helps us in the market. It helps us to win work because our clients like it. Our clients like to work with a contractor who they've got confidence will be there to deliver their project. And it also helps us to work with the best supply chain in the industry, which helps us to deliver high quality products to our clients. And again, our supply chain like the fact they've got certainty of payment and we pay our supply chain on average in 26 days with 98% of invoices paid within 60 days. So again, very good statistics in the sector. To remind everybody, we've got no pension funds and we've got no debt. Our cash position is strong, is robust, is positive every single day of the, of the year, just as we think uh, contractors' balance sheets should be. We have a strong portfolio of PFI investments worth £45 million. And importantly, those investments generate around £4 million of annuity interest income each year. So I will come back to that a little bit later in terms of how we share the value of that with our shareholders. And our monthly, uh, average month end cash position was 135 million pounds, a little bit lower than last year because of the investment in the acquisitions that I've mentioned, because of the investment in that digital uh, cloud systems, and because we're partway through doing a share buyback program. So during the year, we uh, we, we, we distributed £20 million to our shareholders through dividends and share buyback. So overall, a really strong balance sheet, very helpful for the business. In terms of how we use that balance sheet and how we uh, our capital allocation policy, most importantly, we would continue to retain and, uh, and focus on retaining that strong balance sheet. 
I've already talked about the competitive advantage it brings in terms of clients and supply chain. It also allows us to invest in the business, whether that be in quality, in digital tools, in our people, or in further acquisitions, Bolton acquisitions at the right time. Our strategy doesn't require any further Bolton acquisitions, but we've got the balance sheet strength and agility to respond to opportunities that may arise. The strong balance sheet also gives us the confidence that we can pay a growing and sustainable dividend to our shareholders. And again, that dividend has improved significantly in the year just finished. And where appropriate, we will return excess cash to our shareholders. And this is the case over the last year, we have been undertaking a 15 million pound share buyback program. And we've also announced a 12p special dividend that will be paid in October. So coming on to the strategy and the outlook, and some of you will have seen uh, this slide before. There's four cornerstones to our strategy. Um, what we're looking to do is to focus on being a progressive business, a business which is socially responsible in its delivery, a business which focuses on quality. And we think by doing that, we'll continue to deliver growing financial returns to our shareholders. And you can see as we grow towards 2026, we expect our revenue to grow up towards 1.6 billion pounds and our divisional operating margin to grow to 3%. We'll do this by focusing on growth in our existing markets and through growth in higher margin adjacent markets. Our existing markets include buildings, so that includes education, healthcare, justice, so courts and prisons, and defense, as well as commercial offices and rented uh, accommodation. In highways, we work for local authorities and for national highways. And our environment business works for all of the major water companies across the UK. Our adjacent markets include moving into the developer uh, end of the PRS markets. So that's putting our balance sheet to use to make sure we get some developer gains as well as constructing PRS accommodation. It's about moving into the capital maintenance and asset optimization part of the water market, where we think higher technology and water technologies will help us deliver higher margin uh, returns in that part of the market. And increasingly using our facilities management business to deliver green retrofits to our clients, so helping to reduce the operational carbon footprint of existing buildings. Importantly, all of these markets are resilient and these markets underpin our growth aspirations. What's really important and has changed probably over the last five to 10 years is that our clients are now pro procuring their work in a much more mature way, focusing on value and not just lowest cost. And that's really important. You should all be encouraged by that, by the fundamental improvement in the way that the large procurement bodies are operating, as well as our top tier private sector clients. What this does is it generates a sustainable environment with high levels of collaboration between contractor and client. And that's a good outcome for everybody. It means we can deliver higher quality products and we can deliver that in a more predictable way for our own shareholders. Our supply chain has proved resilient through the difficulties and the economic challenges of the last 18 months or so. That of course benefits from our focus on our advantage to alignment program, bringing our supply chain very close to the business. And of course, we benefit from the good payment record that we have with our supply chain. About this time last year, we introduced what we call our enhanced supply chain checks, additional financial due diligence process that we put in place to make sure that we're staying really close to our supply chain, that we're preempting any issues that there might be to again, make sure that we can protect our projects and make sure we can deliver quality projects going forwards. The market opportunities remain really robust. The markets we operate in, uh, the markets I've mentioned are non-cyclical, and we can see that solid pipeline of opportunity even beyond our current order book. And most of that work will come through long-term frameworks. And those frameworks give us established clients with established terms and conditions. And through that framework, we can see to 2026 and well beyond. So we've got some really good framework positions that take us out in some cases to 2030. What this slide shows you is the procurement route of, and, and the typical scoring mechanisms, mechanisms in the way that we win work 
in our order book. And you can see on the left hand, uh, uh, I'm sorry, on, uh, on the pre let me just go back to the previous slide. Uh, I'm sorry. So, so what this what this slide shows you is is the breakdown of the order book between building and infrastructure. So you can see on the left hand side how the building order book breaks down between education, defence, custodial, healthcare, and on the right hand side you can see between environment, which is largely water companies, and highways. Importantly, everything in that order book has come through our clear risk management process. But what I want to call out is those statistics on the right hand side. So when we started the new financial year to June 2024, we had 92% of our revenue already secured. And we've got about 75% of revenue secured for the following financial year through to June 2025. So that puts us in a really, really strong position. And you can see that the median contract size in our building business is less than 20 million pounds. What that demonstrates is the large portfolio of relatively small projects, which is really aligned to our risk management uh, priorities. And what this slide then shows you uh, is the way that we have procured work in that 3.7 billion pound order book. So the left hand bar chart there shows the procurement route and you can see 90 eight and a half percent of our work has come through some kind of negotiated two-stage process. So that's where we get appointed to the project based on our quality, based on our people, based on our experience. And we then negotiate the price in a one-to-one -one negotiation based on established designs and based on detailed quotes from our supply chain. And the, bar, uh, and, and the pie chart on the right-hand side shows an indicative scoring criteria for one such job. And you can see most of the score come through non-financial metrics, such as our management team, our project delivery capabilities, in some cases, social value, sustainability, low carbon credentials, and so on, with relatively uh, few marks on the financial aspects, which includes balance sheet strength, how we pay the supply chain, as well as price and embedded fee. And it's really important that this shows you that our order book, about 3.7 billion pounds, has all been procured in a very risk managed way, very disciplined way, and in support of our 3% margin targets. I mentioned earlier that most of our work comes through frameworks. And you can see on the slide here, some examples of those positions. Frameworks provide us with long-term, high quality workloads and really good visibility of the future. They provide established terms and conditions, as I said earlier, with repeat clients. So this is an excellent route to market for us. You can see that we use frameworks across all of our sectors, and you can see how this extends well into the future with those lighter green uh, bars representing potential future renewals. Importantly, those framework positions take us well beyond the next general election and take us therefore well beyond any uncertainty that may arise you know, as we go through an election year. So pulling this together, in the three years since we demerged the house building business, we've declared ordinary full year dividends of 23 pence per share, 25 million pounds. We've declared a special dividend of 12p per share, which will be paid in October this year. And we've declared a 15 million pounds share buyback program of which we're currently 14 of the 15 million pounds through. And that share buyback program will increase earnings per share by about seven and a half percent every year going forwards. During the last year, as I mentioned earlier, we settled a long running dispute and consistent with our capital allocation policy, we're returning half of those proceeds, the 12, the 12 p special dividend to our shareholders, with the remaining half being invested in growth into the business. And this year, we've also improved our ordinary dividend cover policy to 1.8 times cover. The basis for that, alongside the confidence in the future outlook of the business, what we want to do is to reflect the value in that PFI portfolio, the 45 million pounds PFI portfolio on the balance sheet. So essentially what that 1.8 times cover represents is twice covered dividends on our operational earnings and full return of the annuity interest income from that PFI portfolio. And that gives us a blended 1.8 times dividend cover. So what that means is that we declared last week a 7.5p final dividend, 10.5p full year dividend, for the financial year, 31% increased on the year before. And of course, really importantly, as we deliver our strategy, as we deliver revenue growth and margin growth, our dividends will continue to increase in line with our growth 
in profit and in earnings per share. So to summarize, we're in really good shape as a business. We had a really good performance in the year just finished to June 2023. Importantly, we've got a really strong outlook and a really strong start to the year for the new financial year to June 2024. We've got increasing visibility through to 2026 on our financial targets and beyond through our framework positions. We're progressing well against the targets that we set. And importantly, we're doing and delivering exactly what we said we would do. And what that means is that we're able to provide increasing returns to our shareholders. And with that, I'll hand back to Lily and then we will take any questions that you may have. Thank Andrew, you. thank you very much for your presentation this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab situated on the top right hand corner of your screen. Just while the company take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your Investor Dashboard. Andrew, as you can see, we have received a number of questions throughout today's presentation. Could I please ask you to read out the questions and give responses where appropriate to do so, and I'll pick up from you at the end. I will do, Lily, thank you very much indeed. So the first question comes from James. So thank you, James. The question is capital allocation. What can we expect from dividends and buybacks? And are we seeing further opportunities to reinvest cash rather than return it? So what we're trying to do, James, is make sure we get the balance between investing in growth and providing returns to our shareholders. So we think the 1.8 times cover gets that balance right. So we're, we don't have any uh, pension fund to, 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 to uh, to put our cash to so effectively we give a, a good return on our profits to our shareholders but we are then able to invest in growth in the business and the areas that we really see that one is in the prs space so putting some investment into the developer uh, development phase of the prs schemes and we've just done financial close on our first prs scheme we've got a pipeline of other prs schemes that we are looking to invest in looking to uh, to take options on the land take those through the planning and the, the, the development phases before we sell them to, to other forward funds. We also potentially see further opportunity in the water space particularly. So as I said earlier, we're not requiring and we're not having to do any further M&A, but there may well be other opportunities for bolt-on M&A as we go forward, having done three very successful acquisitions. So we're trying to make sure we get the balance right between growth and returns to our shareholders. And we think the, the dividend cover policy uh, just about gets that gets that right. Uh, second question also from James uh, about inflation. So the question is managing inflation in long-term projects and contracts. How do we manage this to maintain our margins? So there's a few things there, James, just to, to pick up. And what we are seeing on inflation is that we're seeing that really stabilizing, certainly compared to this time last year or, or even 18 months ago. Um, so what, we're not seeing prices come down, but we are seeing a bit more stability and able to to predict prices much uh, much easier than we were so and what's important to remember of course is that across that large portfolio of relatively small jobs each of those jobs is is tendered based on current pricing so whenever we get a negotiation and we discuss the pricing with a client we're doing that based on current pricing pricing submitted by our supply chain and what we look then to do is to lock those prices in as soon as we lock our price in uh, with our with our clients so that that makes sure that we mitigate uh, any change in inflation. We, of course, include inflation risk allowances in our pricing as well. Um, but we're really then looking at the, the delta between you know, prices that have been set by the supply chain and, and what might happen in a, in, in, a short, you know, in a short window. Importantly, everything in our uh, environment and highways businesses, that is all uh, drew, uh, delivered on a target cost, cost reimbursable basis. So when you set that target cost based on supply chain pricing at the outset we're then paid our actual costs uh, up against that target so again there's inflation mitigations in that form of contract and what we found last year even when inflation was really spiky we were able to put some inflation mitigations into some of our other fixed price contracts but what's really important james is that because of that large portfolio of contracts because of the way that we set the business and the risk appetite of the business if we find that there was inappropriate um, terms and conditions, or if we find that the client is not, if you like, accepting the fact that prices are more expensive now than they were 18 months ago, then we're quite happy to walk away and not take on those contracts. So there's nobody in the business is under any pressure to take on contracts which don't have the right pricing 
all the right terms and conditions. And so by maintaining that discipline, that then helps us deliver the margin growth that we're looking to achieve. So the next question is from David. So can contracts on frameworks be delayed or slowed down? And what impacts can this have? And is all the work we were intended? So David, uh, thank you for the question. So, so there are different types of, of framework. Um, so some of the frameworks we're on are effectively uh, sole position. So once we're appointed to the framework, uh, and this is the case in some of the regions of some of the water companies, then effectively all of the uh, work in that particular uh, area would, would come to us. We'd then negotiate on the pricing. And of course, if we can't agree the pricing, there's no obligation to undertake the work. Other frameworks are more, um, if you like, um, uh, pre-qualification, so kind of shortlists for future work. So the, the client may put four or five contractors onto a framework, and then what they'd look to do is to bring each piece of work out to those parties who are on the framework. And then again, we can decide whether we want to negotiate for that particular piece of work or not. So there are different mechanisms in the way that the frameworks work. But importantly, all the work that comes through it is on those established terms and conditions with the established embedded margins. And it's all about negotiating the price. And so it's not about tendering kind of lowest cost wins. It's all about negotiating uh, pricing. And if the pricing doesn't work, then we would not undertake the work. A question from Alistair. Are we likely to benefit from the issues with rack concrete? So yes, it's a topical question, Alistair. And, and you know, of course, our expectation is that there is rack in more than just schools, by the way. There'll be rack in, in, in all sorts of other buildings, although typically it's in parts or elements of buildings rather, rather than the, the whole buildings. What we're seeing at the moment, particularly if I focus on schools, is I think there's 174 schools that are currently being identified with rack issues. That's out of a, a state of 22,000 schools. So it's a relatively small uh, population uh, of schools which are affected. Obviously, it's a huge issue if it's, it's the school that you or your, your children attend. So what we see is that the Department for Education, are ex we expect them to continue to deliver the new build program which they are uh, delivering at the moment and which we are working on and delivering new schools under. There may be in the unallocated elements of those budgets some reallocation between schools you know, to do some more of the RAC work or, and of course, the rack where they've identified it in those schools, some of that will be very minor. Some will, you know, the whole school will need to be brought down and, and, and rebuilt. So, so where there is additional uh, school building, I think we would stand to, to benefit. But we don't see this as actually having a significant impact on the outlook uh, for our workload across education or, or other sectors. Question from John. What are our new non-ERP system IT costs? Uh, and how have they been impacted by the new ERP system implementation? So, so John, we have, of course, we have a whole plethora of, of different um, IT systems. The key thing, of course, is that we try to make sure that they are as integrated as possible. So our new ERP system, which is an Oracle cloud-based system, that takes us all the way now from our pipeline reporting, so if you like, our customer CRM system, all the way through to, to finalization and delivery of, of the projects, all the commercial, the procurement, the finance, as well as all of our uh, HR systems. Of course, there's a whole series of other uh, systems that we use, whether that be for design or for health and safety and, and, and so on and so forth. So there's a whole series of systems which, which interface with that Oracle system, which is our core uh, ERP system. So, but what we've done in, in the uh, upgrade is by going onto the cloud-based system, what we now do is we get a, a process of continual improvement. So every quarter we get the latest updates, we're able to roll those updates out into the business. So rather than this sort of old fashioned way of implementing a system and then waiting kind of you know, 10 years until it goes out of support and then having to implement a new system, well now we get this constant uh, upgrade, constant improvement, constant uh, business improvement as a result. So actually this is really exciting that we'll be able to deliver improvement across the business. And, and I should say that system went live earlier uh, this month. We've already made uh, payroll payments. We've already made uh, supplier payments. We've already raised invoices to customers. So actually that system uh, has, has landed really successfully and we've had some really good feedback from across the business, which is, which is really encouraging. Lily, for the time being, that, that concludes the questions which are on the uh, Q&A.
Andrew, thank you. And I think you've addressed all those questions that you can from investors. And of course, the company can review all questions submitted today and we will publish those responses on the Investor Meet company platform. Before redirecting investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to yourself and the company, could I please just ask you for a few closing comments? Yeah, thank you, Lee. So, so what I'd really summarise is that Guy for Try is in really good shape. We're operating in markets that are robust, they're not cyclical, they're not affected by the political cycle as we go into a general election year. We've got a really strong outlook for the new financial year to, FY, to, to June 2024 and increasing confidence in, our, in meeting our strategic targets through to 2026. Putting that together, our dividend for the year just finished increased 31%. And we see great opportunity for increasing that dividend further as we grow our revenue, as we grow, more importantly, our profit uh, through to 2026. So as we make good progress against those targets, we expect to continue to deliver increasing shareholder returns. So that's really the, the message that I would leave everybody with. Andrew, thank you for updating investors today. Can I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Galliford Tri Holdings PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. Good afternoon to you all. Thank you.